call this meeting of the Salt Lake City Historic Landmark Commission to order. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We've got a big crowd for a short agenda, so why don't we dispense with our regular recurring administrative stuff real fast and then we'll get to the meat of it. Um, this evening there was a field trip at four o'clock followed by dinner downstairs. Um, there was no substantive business conducted at either of those. Um, so before we jump into things, would anyone like to make a motion to approve the minutes from the December meeting? I move. I'll second that. Uh, let's start with you, Jessica. Yes. Pardon me. Second that. <laughs> Aye. Abstain. Aye. Motion passes, I believe. <laughs> um, ordinarily, would would ask for a report of the chair and vice chair. In this case, we don't have either of them here tonight, so you're stuck with me. I have nothing to report. Wayne, anything from planning? <clears throat> yeah, I have a couple of things. Um, one, before I get to the extension that's on the agenda, just to make the uh, commission aware, uh, we do have an I a current issue going on with um, some signs on the Salt Lake Regional Medical Center. Um, <clears throat> if anybody has driven down South Temple um, or around that site, they've seen possibly some um, monument type signs that are digital. Uh, we have had a um, processing issue uh, with those signs. We've had a lot of community complaints um, and, and, and so we're, we're looking into that issue now. Uh, we're working with the community. Uh, the city and uh, the community council are gonna uh, meet with the hospital um, to uh, try to come up with a solution to that issue. So we'll let you know what the, uh, that solution is. Um, just a little bit of background, the Salt Lake Regional Medical Center uh, is a, it's a landmark site and the northwest corner is also in the I believe it's South Temple Historic District. So uh, typically those, those types of um, you know, signs, improvements, anything like that uh, is either comes to the commission or is reviewed administratively. Um, um, but, there, but there was a, uh, appears to be a process error in that. So we'll, we'll keep you informed on what we do with that, um, that process. Um, now, as far as the, on the director's report, we do have a extension of, uh, request for an extension of time for new construction at approximately 563 East uh, 600 South. Uh, it's a request by Kristen Clifford representing the property owner for an extension on a certificate of appropriateness for new construction of a uh, mixed use building. Um, the building would have ground floor commercial, uh, one ground floor residential unit, two upper stories containing three residential units. Uh, the, the proposal includes demolition of existing commercial building on the subject property that is non-contributing to the historic district and a historically contributing duplex on the site is being retained as part of the development. Um, the commission originally granted approval on this project uh, December 7th, 2018, and then also granted a one-year time extension January 3rd, um, 2019. The applicant is asking for another extension of time. They've been working to resolve issues with the uh, fire department um, in the design of the project. And um, in order to, as well as with uh, Rocky Mountain Power on some utility issues, um, in order to try to overcome those, are asking for another um, additional year. The project planner that worked on the project is here. If you have any questions, um, again, it's, it's uh, just an extension of time. It's not an approval of the project. Uh, I believe the applicant may be here too if you have any questions. Commissioners, does anyone want to hear from staff or the applicant? Well, then, uh, would anyone be interested in making a motion? It's not on the motion sheet, but I move to, is it just grant the one-year extension? Yes. All right. 
I'll second that. Jessica, start us off. Aye. 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 Still aye. Aye. Motion approved. Uh, well, with that, uh, we typically ask if anyone would like to comment on anything that does not pertain to what's on the agenda tonight. Cindy, come on up. Um, my name is Cindy Cromer, and I want to comment on an item that is on the agenda but not scheduled for a hearing, and that's the one you just granted an extension on. I am seeing a great number of requests for extensions on the landmarks agenda and also on the planning commission agenda. They tend to be um, related to issues with loans, the fire marshal, and also now with Rocky Mountain Power. In previous days, an issue with Rocky Mountain Power might be addressed by the amazing staff in community and economic development um, intervening. I think the city needs to resolve some of these issues with the fire marshal, especially because that's a city department, and possibly with Rocky Mountain Power. The issues regarding loans um, can't be addressed by the city unless the city has loan funds available. But these projects are largely smaller projects. That's interesting, largely smaller projects. Anyway, they tend to be smaller projects, and um, they're getting held up. And this one has been held up for an exceptionally long time, and it has neighborhood support. So um, since the cameras are rolling, I hope somebody out there um, in TV land will pay attention to the fact that a lot of these things are getting held up. It is not the planning staff's division to troubleshoot why these things are getting held up. Thanks. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to anything not on the agenda tonight? Great. Well, then why don't we move to uh, the loan agenda item, which is PLN HLC 2019-00860, the Masonic Temple Apartments at approximately 33 South, 600 East. Um, Lex, why don't you take it away? Mr. Chair for today, before we begin. Um, I need to disclose, I don't feel I need to recuse myself, but I know one of the architects who will be presenting this evening. Um, his spouse works for me, and we've had dinner together. There is no material benefit coming to me or anyone in my family. I believe I can remain impartial, but because of the nature of this and how many emails we've had, I want to disclose it early and defer to my fellow commissioners. Uh, well, we appreciate the disclosure. Um, from my understanding of the conflicts ordinance, I don't think that presents a problem, given what you've said, but well, let's always ask Paul. Yeah, so I, I did uh, speak with uh, Victoria earlier this evening about this. The city ordinance is concerned about material benefit to uh, the commissioner or their immediate family members as a result of participating in a, uh, a particular matter. Um, and. Uh, she's indicated that that's uh, not something that uh, she will benefit from uh, materially. I also have the concern when it comes uh, to these kinds of issues um, as far as due process goes. If somebody, because of a relationship they have, they don't believe that uh, that they can remain uh, impartial or, you know, if it's the subject matter or whatever. Um, and uh, I have no concerns based on uh, my conversation with uh, Commissioner Petro Eschler. Terrific. Well, I think that we can move on. Lex, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be brief in my presentation tonight and turn the majority of the time over to the applicant for presentation. But please feel free to ask questions of me at any time. Um, as you are aware and have previously seen, this is a request from DB Urban Communities representing the property owner, the Masonic Temple Association. Um, they're requesting a certificate of appropriateness for new construction for a multifamily development of approximately 125 units located at approximately 33 South 600 East in the South Temple and Central City Historic Districts. Just to refresh your memory, this is a site plan. This is a subject property. Um, here we go. This is 600 East here, and this is South Temple, and this is the Masonic Temple building itself. 
This is a rendering of the proposal. You've seen this before at the work session that was held in December. In terms of background, I, that work session, um, the, you, the H, the Historic Landmark Commission, requested that the applicant provide additional information, um, some clarity as follows. There are a couple points. Um, you requested more detailed information regarding the 600 East building facade and the interaction from the sidewalk pedestrian point of view, as well as a streetscape along 6th East to show how the building relates to the neighboring properties. Um, the applicant is going to talk about that in detail with you. I'm not going to go into that. They're much um, more well versed with, with that issue than I am. Um, I want to say that after the preparation and distribution of the staff report last Friday, the planning division started to receive a lot of written comment. We forwarded that on to you. Um, we've received comments, both positive and negative. Um, and I wanted to respond to a couple of comments received. These comments have to do with process, and we take process very seriously. Um, the proposed Masonic Temple apartment project is new construction in a historic district, as you are aware. Um, and as such, this is not the type of development that requires recognized community organization notification. And that recognized community organization, um, i.e. community councils, they are part of that. Um, and that is per the Salt Lake City Code. There are certain types of projects that do require notification of those recognized community organizations. However, new construction in a historic district is not one of them. In fact, the only one that you would, that, that you would be involved with that would require that type of notification would be demolition in a historic district. But having said that, as a courtesy, I personally notified the, the three community councils that are within proximity of the proposed project. I also notified them in writing of the open house that was held in November. And in addition, as a courtesy, and this is not a code requirement, the applicant agreed to hold that open house to solicit public comment, willing to meet with the public and take comment. Um, early notification of the pending land use project, notification of the open house, notification of tonight's public hearing was mailed to all property owners and residents within 300 feet of the property project property boundaries, that's per code. I personally posted meeting notification signs on the property that's required per code. Um, the agenda for tonight's meeting was posted on the city and state websites and also emailed to those on the city's listserv. Um, to summarize, public notification of this project meets the requirements um, of the Salt Lake City Code. And the second clarification I wanted to make um, was in response to comments received regarding a traffic study. Um, the, the transportation division did review this project. They did not require a traffic study um, given the magnitude of the development and the, and the multiple ingress egress options to the property from 6th East, from South Temple, and from 7th East. Um, certainly the proposed development will increase traffic in the area, however, not to the extent that traffic mitigation measurements are warranted or required. And that said, at this time, um, as outlined in the analysis and findings in the staff report, it is planning staff's opinion that the proposed new construction request substantially meets the applicable standards for approval and the associated multi multifamily design guidelines and therefore recommends that the Historic Landmark Commission approve the request for a certificate of appropriateness for the proposed new construction. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain those. Commissioners, any questions or comments? Thanks, Lex. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, at this point, why don't we ask the uh, applicant to come on up. And uh, I've only got a couple of comment cards, which seems surprising given the number of people in the audience. So if you want to maybe pass them to the end over here and uh, people can bring them up to Paul and he'll hand them my way. Thank you. Sorry. 
while while Lex is <coughs> is being even more technically savvy than I am, uh, do a quick introduction. I'm Dustin Hold, a principal at DB Urban Communities. With me tonight is Jason Woodland, who is the president of the Masonic Temple Association. Meek Nadobri with Architectural ne Nexus, as well as David Abraham with Architectural Nexus, who have been the design team on this project uh, since inception. I We've got a, a, a slideshow presentation. Before we, before we dig into this, I'd like to turn uh, some time over to Jason Woodland. Uh, before I talk about where we've been kind of the last year, I've asked Jason to share some thoughts on where they've been the last hundred years. He's not going to start with all hundred, but uh, as the president of the association, what they're doing, what they're involved in, the good that they're doing, and, and what they're trying to accomplish. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Uh, wonderful. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your time, uh, esteemed ladies and gentlemen of the Historic Landmarks Commission. I sincerely appreciate uh, you hearing uh, hearing us. Um, I also sincerely appreciate both the um, people who are positive on this concept as well as the ones uh, who are not positive on this concept. I, I see you and I respect you and I hear your concerns. Um, may I share a small story with you? I promise it's not 100 years worth of a story, um, but I will also uh, divulge one of the secrets of Freemasonry. Um, when I was a young man, I, I was always very charitable in nature, always wanted to try and help the community, and I thought as I started getting older, what can I do to become part of something bigger than myself? Um, I was studying secret societies, and no, I'm not alluding to the fact that it's not a fact. We are not a secret society. Um, but when I found out a little bit more about what Freemasonry was, I actually found out mainly their biggest secret was charity and they never pat themselves on the back uh, for what they're doing in the community. The reason why I share some of that stuff is because I then decided to petition a Masonic Lodge 15.5 years ago approximately, and uh, got involved, and, and we had this beautiful building downtown, and, and I thought, wow, you know, we've got, uh, I think it's about 85,000 square feet to be exact. And, uh, and I thought, wow, this is uh, a, a real blessing that we've got something so phenomenal. Well, within our degrees, one of the things we talk about um, is inheriting the benefits and the burdens of the fraternity. And I will be here to admit that one of the burdens are these magnificent buildings that we've built all around the world, um, in this country specifically. Um, being involved in Freemasonry, um, I was able to become a Shriner, and uh, some of you may have heard of Shriner's Hospital. Um, those are our uh, Masonic uh, uh, founded hospitals. Um, within our building, we also have what is called Right Care of Utah, where we help uh, children with speech impediments, learning disabilities, dyslexia, uh, and no cost to the parents. We have a professional staff of, of speech therapists um, that we do within that building. So. Um, I want to first uh, explain sort of the process of, of, well, first of all, who are we? I mean, what, what are we actually doing here? Uh, that Masonic temple houses five lodges, the Scottish Rite, the York Rite, the Shriners, uh, the Ladies of the Nile, the Eastern Star, the Job's Daughters, which is a young women's organization, and the Malay, which is a young men's organization. We teach these young people that they're all Masonically sponsored on, on how to become adults and how to public speak and how to become involved in the community and, and so forth. Um, a handful of years uh, uh, throughout my experience, I was, I was blessed to have some leadership opportunities within uh, Freemasonry. And one of those was to uh, join the Board of Directors. The Board of Directors, as with all of Freemasonry, is all volunteer. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not a paid uh, person on the board. Um, within a, a few years, uh, it was, uh, um, I was elected to become president of the board. And that is definitely a blessing and a curse, to say the least. Um, the blessing is that I'm thankful that I can uh, help lead um, the, the charge on management of this magnificent building. And I've got an extreme passion uh, for historical uh, projects and historical buildings. I'm also the president of the, of the uh, uh, Holiday Chamber of Commerce, and I've 
been hearing a lot about the Conwood Mall situation going on over there. Um, so through this process, I started looking at the financial situation of our building. And the unique thing about Freemasonry, we're the oldest fraternity on the planet. Um, the thing that's, that's cool about that is because we've got a lot of wonderful history. Um, George Washington, uh, 16 signers of the Declaration of Independence, all the way to Duke Ellington, Buzz Aldrin. Um, a lot of wonderful people have, have, have walked the degrees of our fraternity. Um, as I got on the economic side of this, and I realized Freemasonry, as with a lot of wonderful public, private, civic organizations, um, are, are falling in membership. Uh, the state of Utah used to have approximately 5,600 members. Uh, we're under 2,000 now. That's from Logan to St. George. We have temples all over the, all over the state. Some of them are small center block structures, and, and uh, some are a little bit bigger, but nothing, compl nothing comes close to the building that we're in uh, at this point in time. So when I figured the financial analysis of the building, um, I'm going to be transparent and, and vulnerable with you. Uh, with the amount of masons that we have, it's, it's not sustainable for a long period of time. Uh, thankfully, we've got Dan Brown on our side, and he keeps writing cool books about us, and every time he does, we get a little bit of a spike in interest, and, and a few more brothers uh, join our, our, our ranks. We don't, uh, uh, we don't have missionaries. We don't have anybody that sends anybody out. We don't recruit. Um, so it's an interesting situation that we're in for membership. Uh, so, it, so what it boils down to is that uh, we were trying to figure out how to save the Masonic Temple, so to speak. We, we didn't know exactly what to do. So all the way back in 2008, the process of trying to figure out a land lease uh, came up from my brother Ridge, who was two presidents ago. 2008 came, decimated everything quite a few years later. Obviously, um, nobody was building anything. What we did is, and, and by the way, if you can give me sort of a something if I'm talking too long. Well, let, let me just uh, say, I'm actually finding what you're saying totally interesting. Um, however, we, uh, we as a commission will be focusing really closely on the standards and the guidelines. And to the extent that your group can focus on that, that would be super helpful. Absolutely. And we'll do the same for uh, people who may be speaking on the other side. Wonderful. I'll, uh, uh, to to uh, quote Dave Chappelle, I'll wrap this gavel up. Um, so uh, just, just to finish that part is um, we were looking at doing a capital campaign. That wasn't going to work because of the nature of our organization. Uh, then we said, what do we need to do? We, we hired Internet Properties, Vasilios Priscos, um, J.R. Howa, and Mike Farrow to help represent us. And we said we didn't want to sell the property. Um, we wanted to make sure that it was a lease. Um, none of us benefit financially, um, individually. It's just the temple in general. We're just trying to save the building. Um, we believe that uh, with uh, Mike Farrow, who found DB Urban after a handful of different de developers throughout the years, uh, we found that uh, these gentlemen were uh, extremely well, well versed in their background. They understood the historical nature and the importance of uh, making sure that our area in the South Temple District is not disrupted by a distru disruptive or ugly building. And we have full faith and confidence in their ability to do what they're going to do. Um, all we knew is we needed to do a land lease. We had no clue what it was going to be. As far as I was concerned, just as long as our economics were able to connect, if they told us it was going to be a big swimming pool, I would have been on board with that. Um, but they came back with this uh, beautiful structure, in my opinion, and that's what we're here to speak about this evening. Thank you sincerely from the bottom of my heart for listening to me. I know that was a little bit of a long diatribe, but I just wanted to uh, give you a little bit of a background on what we are and who we are and what we're trying to do here. Thank you, Jason. Mr. Substitute Chair and Commissioners, thank you tonight for your time. I know that um, from our conversations, you've seen much of this, so some of it I'll skip over. Uh, over the last year, since the Masonic Temple Association decided to get uh, our organization involved in this site, this is the approval process that we've been through. So we've been to the Community Council uh, for a public open house related to the zoning back in April of last year, a work session with many of you uh, talking about the ultimate plan and goal of this project planning commission presentation in may city council in august uh, public open house the the courtesy open house that lex alluded to in november we had a discussion with 
most of y'all on in December of last year and then we're here tonight. Um, whether it was members of the public, members of this body, members of the Planning Commission, members of the City Council, uh, anyone who would share comments and thoughts with us, we tried to take those and we really took kind of eight or nine of those points that we then based most of our design. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about these, but turn the critical stuff over to architectural nexus. So we heard that the 600 East streetscape was of massive import and pedestrian scale thereof. And that a two-story volume along the west facade of this building and preferably along the south facade is something that needed to be looked at and addressed. A possible preservation of the carriage home. Uh, we've learned the carriage home is not a contributing or is a non-contributing structure, but the preservation thereof is important to us. Uh, whether or not we could create a public space or a public place of some type. The ex, uh, main building, any mass and significant mass, trying to get it to the further eastern portion of this lot, mid block, was something that was mentioned. Uh, landscape preservation, the wonderful trees along 600 East so that we're not all driving past looking at the garage entrance, trying to figure out how to integrate the garage entrance onto a different side of the property than the most prominent 600 east side of the, pro of the property. And then again, a mid-block pedestrian uh, connection point. So as, as we had this roughly acre and a half of site, first thing we looked at under the current zoning ordinance is a 60% land coverage area up to 60 feet of height. We do have about 10 feet of fall on this site from east falling to west uh, to 600 east. We then started to look at some of these items that I mentioned. So we looked at first reducing and getting within the 60% uh, land area coverage. We then looked at making certain on the left side of the screen is 600 East, making certain that along 600 East was the two story element. We also took the context on the south side of the property as well as we looked at exploring making certain we could provide usable functional space with this new building this middle donut hole inevitably came out as we stood on the the vacant parking lot and looked to the east you've got these wonderful stepped and terraced mountains as we look to the west we've got wonderful stepped and and terraced buildings the design team thought it would be appropriate that this building also mimicked some of that same design stepping terracing and so intentionally and very specifically certain corners of the building were taken out on the south facade in order to accommodate a pedestrian walkway we exceeded the side yard setback by five feet so we reduced this side of the building by five feet on the north side of the building as we looked at getting a drive meandering drive into the north side of this building it required the removal of six feet of the north side of this building and instead of trying to allow the parking lot to come in and then push the building back out to the side yard setback we said we'll work with this we'll do we'll address this six feet so that six feet was removed on the north facade that left us with this cube that's where a lot of uh, time and effort and energy was then spent with architectural nexus to make certain that we're, we were addressing the standards uh, of the ordinance. The, the wonderful thing about city staff is that you didn't see the first three attempts that we brought to Lex that were denied, that needed attention, needed addressing. And that's really the process that we went through. This is a, a quick aerial site plan showing the site. So you can see again, the 21 foot setback, six feet greater than required on the north side to get the drive off of 6th East. You can see the sidewalk, the meandering walkway, the 20 foot setback here. You can see the 25 foot uh, deep product on the south side to create what then becomes in excess of 45 feet at a two-story height along the south facade of the building. And you can see here on the west facade of the building a 35-foot deep two-story brownstone product that you'll see. So together with the 25-foot setback, we're more than 60 feet of depth from the sidewalk. 
Uh, this is a required fire ingress, egress, hammerhead turnaround for aerial apparatus for the building. And as we looked at the MU, we thought the only thing that will draw someone to the middle of this block is something of interest. And so the, the intent and part of the certificate of appropriateness would be the relocation of the carriage house back into this corner, ultimately creating it into something that is a nod to the Masons, what was here, what has been here, what they've created. Uh, and I, I apologize, a lot of this line weight I know on the screen doesn't come through super well. We've got some printed copies that we'll hand out. But we've got, uh, per your kind of request last time, we looked at the streetscape along 600 East. So the Mason, the Masonic Temple itself, the Walker McCarthy Mansion adjacent to it, this property, this section is at the in that first 60 feet, so it's at the two-story volume. So I, I want to make certain that's very clear, but you can see the volume of this building as it relates to even some of the larger single-family homes to the south of it. The, this is, hey, Meek, if you want to hand these out, these are, these, this is hot off the, the press. Uh, this is it, some strong encouragement and suggestion from individuals in the community. Uh, Lex as well, again, appreciate all that Lex has done. We printed these because I knew this line weight on this TV might not come up. Um, this might be a better image to click to, but you have this packet. And Meekna can correct me if I'm wrong. This is standing on the sidewalk with a camera held at five foot nine inches high looking through a 35-foot space between the property owned by the Simnani organization and the Walker McEwen Mansion. The reason the line weight in the background back here appears small and low is the facade, the north facade of our building is in excess of 220 feet from where this picture was taken, from the sidewalk. Roads, cars, vehicles traveling in South Temple are obviously another 20, 30, 40 feet into the street. This lower picture is a glimpse looking through the 35 feet between the Simnani office building and the Masonic Temple itself. And you can see the height of the uh, northeast corner of our building through that 35 foot shot and glimpse. We felt this was, this was important. We had been asked to do it and so wanted to prepare that. A Couple of elevations and renderings. You can see the, the trees and the heights along, or the trees, the height of those trees along 600 East. Many of those are incredible. They're phenomenal. They exceed even the height of this building. Not just the two story elements, but the entirety of the height of this building. A couple of those renderings from different angles, aerials from different angles. We'll get into to this here. Um, I'm gonna, you, you've seen this, most of this, some of the south, north, east elevations, some of the materiality. Down on the first floor in the brownstones, making certain that we've got aluminum storefront doors and windows. We've got brick facade. Um, this two-story, two-story volume space and these brownstones and the pedestrian connection that they create along this street is absolutely of the most paramount importance to us. It also creates setbacks, 20, an additional 25, an additional 30 feet before the building of any height or significant rises. And it pushes that mass and volume to the middle of the block, closer to the uh, Masonic Temple itself that exceeds all buildings in this area. And when we were before this body before, one of the questions that was asked was this north facade. This is the north facade, and this is after the six foot additional setback that we looked at. Um, these numbers might be a little harder to see. The window reveal design is a four inch reveal. You've got 18 inch and, and two foot six, so 28 inch reveals with five foot balconies. This facade has fenestration articulation. It has push and pull. It's not a long, sterile wall. It's got movement, it's got motion. We're looking at this as four-sided architecture. We presented the 600 East facade to you in our work session, and one of the questions was, is, is this stepping and pushing and pulling consistent around the building? And we wanted to show you that it is. 
One of the other questions that, uh, this is the southeast corner, so again down along 600 east, you can see again those two foot, uh, four step backs. The five foot reveals low, up higher for some of the balconies. The four inch window reveals and, and that creation. One of the things that we had talked about is this 15 foot depth. And you had asked us to specifically kind of look at that. We talked about the stepping uh, of this landscaping, the opportunity to create planters separation from the sidewalk and the building, these patios, an area where people can congregate. So again, these, these numbers might be uh, smaller for you. Uh, the sidewalk line is here. It's over six feet back to the actual property line itself seven feet from there back to the first phase of this landscape box. This landscape box is three feet deep to allow for grasses and low growies and other elements. And then a 15 foot patio or setback from here back to the, the start of the two story brownstones. And then the two story brownstones themselves, this element is 35 feet deep before any of the other mass and height starts. That's where that 60 feet of depth from the property line is. In excess of 60 feet from the sidewalk itself because the property line starts uh, further east than the sidewalk. One of the other questions was the trees. We know there are significant trees. Certainly any of the trees on in the 600 east right of way we want and fully expect to implement a tree protection zone as required by the ordinance. There are two trees that are on this property inside between the sidewalk and the parking lot itself. There are two trees that we know will be lost in this process. We, we are identifying those. There are two more that depending on the depth of excavation and footing we may lose. Regardless, and as part of this packet and certificate of appropriateness, we're proposing the installation of seven new trees behind the sidewalk between our property, the patios, the sidewalk itself to replace those four. Additionally, along the pedestrian mew, we're looking at another 10 to 12 trees in this concept. And furthermore, for the softening of the east side of the building and the softening of the remaining parking lot, we're looking at the new introduction of trees back in that area along the uh, drive for the fire aerial apparatus access. Uh, with that, I'll turn some time over to Meekna to talk specifically about the, fa the form of the building and how we came to the form of the building. Thank you, Dustin. And um, as you've already alluded, we've been working with um, Lex extensively to create a narrative that addresses um, all 86 design standards out of the multifamily uh, design and historic districts. And uh, you're, I'm, I'm not going to touch on every one of those, but uh, you um, have access to that narrative. I'll just touch on two or three um, items that I think are the most important. Uh, one is the dark brick. That is a direct reference to the um, historically contributing building to the south. Um, in uh, the other significant um, item that we've been working on is, um, and uh, Dustin's already alluded to this in the massing, but the transition between the larger massing of the buildings on South Temple and the smaller uh, residential single family and multifamily buildings to the south on 600 East. Um, and we're doing that through uh, by interrupting the dark brick with some areas of lighter brick in order to break down the facade further into masses that relate to the uh, buildings to the south. Uh, the um, additional materials, for example, the cementitious board that we're using as a highlight, um, that's similar to the way that cast stone would have been used on a traditional brick building uh, in this district and in this neighborhood. Um, and then the tripartite organization of the buildings, they typically have three planes, two of which project forward. Uh, or hold back, and then the third is the entry, and we're taking a modern interpretation of that tripartite organization uh, into this more contemporary building. Uh, the, it's interesting to note, for example, the residential building to the south has an asymmetry to that organization with a bay window and an entry that are kind of the entries on the left, and so we're using that in the entry to our building. 
Uh, there's other elements like the fenestration patterns. We've looked at the proportions of the windows down um, down the street, and they have a two to one ratio uh, for, and then a more square organization. And we've used both of those uh, in our building, um, as well as the windows of the Masonic Temple that have a 1.25 to two ratio, and we've used that in our uh, more vertically oriented windows. I'll stop there just so we're not getting into too much detail, but if anybody has any questions, uh, we're happy to address them. And, and I would say the same. If there's any questions, we're happy to address them. Otherwise, we'll sit down. We know there are members of the public here. Um, we know that there's been written notice, some <coughs> for, some against. Uh, we know there's been frustrations about the process. Uh, some of that we don't control. I, I hope this commission understands that. Uh, there's been an overwhelming support recently of, uh, or an overwhelming amount of support for the project that I think you've seen in, in some of the materials that have come in recently. So with that, we'll address any questions and then we'll, we'll sit down and, and would appreciate a chance to address any comments or questions from the public. Well, commissioners, uh, questions for the applicant. One of the written comments that we got this week made reference to the shadows that would be cast particularly on the mansion. Have you done any studies or do you have any input on what will happen in terms of the light? I can, I can answer that. Yes, we have looked at that. And um, the location of this site is actually, as Dustin mentioned, 10 feet lower than the mansion. Um, and with the 20 foot setback that we have on that zone, uh, there, uh, and there's also a parking garage that's between the, the, this site and the mansion. There would not ever be any light that, or any shadows that would be cast on the mansion. Um, can you remind me, um, I think we, this came up in the last meeting, um, why the west side was chosen. Is it because the east side of that parking lot is going like to be to used by the sure. temple? That's amazing that you uh, asked that question because I raised my hand to address that because I saw that, uh, uh, that there was an email that said, why not 7th East? Because 7th East, of course, makes perfect sense. It's a, a main thoroughfare. Um, when we were taking a look at what we were wanting to try and do, uh, we've got an aging membership and we knew that if we developed 7th East as opposed to 6th, now our members are walking through the winter all the way down from the 6th East portion and we're not staffed appropriately to go out and retrieve all of our members. Um, when I first joined the lodge, our average age was 67 years old. Um, again, thank you for uh, uh, Mr. Brown and his books. Um, it's now downtrended to about 44 years old, but we still do have a, a pretty decent con uh, constituency of older members. So that that's really specific um, the, for the reason why. There's, at this point in time, no plan at all to do anything on the 7th East side. I can't say that a board 15 years from now might change their mind or anything along those lines, but that's the reason. Thank you. Was it possible to create access at least from 7th East while maintaining the parking? Because I, I believe that was a, another large concern was the traffic that was going to be produced on 6th East. I'll take I'll take that one. So um, I, I'm trying to get to a site plan so that I can address it. So to to Jason's uh, comment, one of the things when we got involved in this is making certain that we were providing 120, 130 parking stalls. Oh, there we go. Uh, making certain we were providing those 120, 130 parking stalls for their events and having it be as close to the temple as possible. So obviously immediately south of the temple became that location. As to access, um, the temple it's, itself, this access off of, off of 600 East comes to a lower level that ultimately by the back eastern half of this parking level is fully subterranean. There is like 60 parking stalls on this level. That is the access for that level. There is an easement being granted not only to this uh, building for access for residents, but also the fire department in perpetuity from South Temple down the west side of the temple to this hammerhead T that will also serve as a second point of ingress and egress 
to the second parking level. So the, the brownstones on both the west and south side screen that parking structure in its entirety. The approximate story and a half of parking on the north side is adjacent to a story and a half of a parking structure. And on the east facade, you'll have one level of parking and then the four stories of residential space above that. Um, granting a long-term permanent easement and access across here was not something the board was willing to do. I think that knowing there's two curb cuts, the high likelihood and probability is that it still provides a means right now until something were to happen 15 years, 50 years, don't know. At this, we certainly know that this property always has two points of ingress and egress for transportation needs. Um, you've been, in your design, I think, really deferential to the um, residential buildings to the south. Um, what What is your thinking with respect to the height uh, on the north side as you entered the design process with regard to the to the neighboring buildings on South Temple? So we, we talked through this and we talked through it even with members of staff. Part of that and, and that deference as you as you mentioned, these structures themselves are smaller two story structures. They're not as large as the structures to the north. Second point that was addressed the property itself slopes to the southwest. So having more mass of the southwest would make it feel even bigger, even more significant down in the southwest corner. Third point that we looked at and addressed is there, this property in particular has a 10-foot side yard setback, our 20-foot side yard setback, and then our 25-foot two-story product. It's 75 feet before you get into three and four stories on our building. These buildings to the north have a double loaded drive aisle of parking that's 60 feet. They then own some property on the south side of the parking structure. We're also granting an additional 21 feet of setback. So we're in excess of 85, 90 feet from those structures themselves, excluding their parking compared to 75 feet. So as we looked at it, we were trying with staff to create kind of a narrower, a, a narrow window that paid the same respects before the building went to three and four stories of height adjacent to those structures. In doing that, it also forced the building to get a little longer, more elongated into the block. Um, but getting into the middle of the block was something that we heard multiple times was fine. We actually had a couple individuals suggest that we go and, and propose a full additional floor on the easternmost portion of this building. We're 50 feet and zoning is 60, and so there was comment about taking this easternmost portion a whole additional level higher than what we're proposing. You mentioned an easement. Is the easement on the Masonic property or on a, on the Semnani property? This easement is on the Masonic Temple property in perpetuity. I'm not sure that I have any other questions. Anyone? Well, in that case, why don't we open the uh, uh, the open portion of uh, this public meeting? Um, and what I'd like to do, since we have quite a few people who'd like to comment, is I'll uh, ask someone to speak and then I'll do my best to remember to say who's next so he can get prepared. So why don't we, uh, if I could just ask Phil McCarthy to start, please. Uh, yeah. What's that? Yeah. So uh, we're going to, typically we do uh, two minutes uh, per speaker. Um, uh, given the uh, proximity of the property owned by Mr. McCarthy, I'd suggest, if it's okay with you, that we give him five, and then we try and uh, limit the remainder of the uh, comments to two. Mr. McCarthy? Yeah, 
Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, maybe after Mr. McCarthy speaks, we typically have the community, if, there's, if there is a member of the community council available to come up first, but um, we have him. Yeah. Good evening, and thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. I wanted to address the people who spoke with us earlier, and I can certainly sympathize with you. I know how expensive it is to maintain old buildings. If you could uh, speak into the microphone, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> to the commission. I know how expensive it is to maintain historic buildings. And just to make sure, the McCune Mansion was built in 1901. The building that you mistakenly referred to here is called Walker McCarthy. It was built by Matthew Walker in 1904. So we can have a lot of comments. We can do a couple of different things, but I needed to take exception to a couple of things. Here was the thing that came out in April of 2019 that went to the City Council requesting a zoning change. While no specific physical development is under consideration in association with these applications, potential master plan and zoning amendment approvals would allow for residential office type land use in the future. Less than nine months later, we are here debating a project. We did hear from somebody also say, well, Maybe we'll develop something on the seventh east side over the next 40 or 50 years. I sympathize with the aging Masonic you know, clientele, but that's not the reason for the Historic Landmark Commission to destroy a truly historic area. There's plenty of room behind this Masonic temple on the seventh east side. We're not going to destroy any of these trees. We're not going to destroy the historic nature of things. There's really only three things that uh, we should be addressing here now. The first is they didn't get the information right. I sent you, Lex, I walked from the Masonic Temple to the edge of my property. It was 107 steps. I walked front door to front door. It was 178 steps. Yet no one ever came, knocked on the door, put anything under there, said, should we talk? Should we tell you what we're going to do here or something? There's a historic plaque on the building. In order to go around the corner to address this and put in here that on 610 East South Temple is the Broadway at Eccles building. Here it is. There are a tenant in a building. You would have to look very, very closely and really sort of go out of your way. Why would somebody mislabel and misrepresent the most historic property on there was built in 1904, 23 years before the Masonic Temple. The height restrictions. You've been told it will not be higher than the existing buildings to disturb those trees. Matthew Walker planted some of those trees in 1904. I have planted some of those. I don't remember which is which, but certainly it's going to disrupt those trees and it is substantially higher as you can see from their own diagram. The questions you need to ask yourself, if they misidentified this, they couldn't get this much right. The second thing would be the height. And the third thing really is the site. This is a historic district. If there is a need for Masonic Temple apartments off 7th East, whom would they be coming in front of? their own people. The Masonic Temple would be saying, we are the Masonic Temple, and it might be blocking our view or changing some of those things. But we are adamantly opposed this to this project. We were not included. We have seen things that have been mislabeled and misidentified. And after a few emails and calls, I notice about five minutes after six, suddenly something new has been given to you that I have not seen. I'm open to any questions, either from you or from anyone in the audience, if that helps. Commissioners. No, thank you, Mr. McCarthy. I would just mention this. If the Historic Landmark Commission does not preserve these properties, you will forever discourage people from purchasing, protecting, and preserving these historic properties. May, may I ask, um, do you have um, an opinion or a thought on how the project could, could 
respect everything that you're saying and, and move forward still? Certainly. Just take all of the information, all things of hand. You can move it right behind 7th East. There are no issues there. That you're not interfering with any neighbors. Technically, no real historic district. And as we had mentioned through an intermediary, the area on 6th East would be maintained. We had talked to somebody from the Masons, and then we're told now that he is not the person who, you need green space. We would continue to put trees in there. We will put the park, the walkway. You can roller skate in there. You could take your kids for a walk. You could walk the dog in there. So certainly we have always said we would support that, whatever they want to do behind the Masonic Temple coming off 7th East. If they need places to park, they need places to do some things while they were constructing that, we would have green space. We would have open space there. I've been there for 21 years. My intention is to be there for a few more. Thank you. Anything else? Great. Um, since I skipped it initially, is there anyone from a, a community council that would like to present? Okay. Uh, well, then uh, let me ask uh, Joseph Sanders to uh, come on up. And after that, we'll have Cindy Cromer. make sure you can hear, can you hear me? Okay. Thank you for the opportunity, distinguished um, commission members. Um, Jason, a mentor of mine that eloquently spoke of so many things that we do for the community and why the Masonic Temple is important. So I don't want to elaborate too much, but as a historian, you know, by nature and in my studies, I want to talk about the historical significance of that place, but also, um, you know, for future generations, for the right to enjoy the history and the leadership that's been cultivated um, throughout the, um, the history of that Masonic Temple. Um, but I am a representative of one of the oldest lodges at, in, in Utah history, Mount Moriah Lodge Number 2. We've been established in a cornerstone of this community since 1866. Um, Briefly, members, um, um, early civic leaders, you know, such as uh, Christopher Dill, um, were you know influential in creating the first Salt Lake City Library System. In our efforts to promote knowledge and community development and support our community, um, to um, former Supreme Court justices, which um, Calvin Bell, um, who was a distinguished member of the Utah Supreme Court and also a chief Nuremberg investigator, um, that brought many people to justice and and so members of our lodge and also the Masonic family have been doing so many significant things and that's what's alive in that building and not only that spirits alive in that building but also um, in this community um, it is a cornerstone of this of the South Temple District um, ironically Masons you know lay in the Northeast corner and that's the cornerstone of the Northeast um, District of uh, you know South Temple and Seventh East and it's one of the only buildings in the city that was built in the 1920s that was dedicated to the Egyptian revival movement of that time which was um, you know you know was rampant throughout historic buildings and, and and it is representative I think not only of Masonic culture but of the diversity of world culture that's um, you know demonstrated in the symbolism in that building and you know from Gothic Moorish traditions um, and so that's been captured it's a museum of private priceless information, not only the leaders and the archives of those individuals that are hosted there, um, the former, um, you know, some of the initial remnants of the Salt Lake Library system, but also if we lost that, the land lease is what I'm in support of is because it gives us a tool to keep this going on for another hundred years. I'm very... Let's, let's, is, let's wrap it up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you. Cindy, and then next we'll have uh, Todd Brashear. There is a copy for each of you, starting with um, Wayne Mills. Um, I don't know if my voice will hold up. If it fails, you'll have to read on your own. I want to start with the context for this proposal, this beleaguered block, which is in two historic districts, 
Due east is the site of a former four square slightly damaged in a fire and then allowed to collapse through lack of enforcement and the wrong ownership. The former mayor overturned your decision, which was consistent with the ordinance. To the south of that, an adaptive reuse of a building burned in a fire. Next to that, a building called Annie's College, which, Cottage, which is really not Annie's Cottage because Annie's Cottage burned completely in a fire along with the garages for Madsonia Court. We lost three contributory structures in the early years of the Central City Historic District west of the Armstrong Jones Mansion. Then there is the graffiti-encrusted Mansodian Court, which stands empty during a housing shortage. There was a gas leak there, and I thought we might lose the entire block. Skip over a few wonderful structures, and you encounter a recent enforcement case in filled townhouses where the developer saw no reason to follow the plans you had approved. This block is the patent place of preservation. Of course, it is wonderful that there will be reinvestment on this block, this beleaguered block, and even more wonderful that it will be housing which does not precipitate the demolition of existing housing or of any historic structures. The parking lot for the Masonic Temple is one of the largest expanses of asphalt west of the University of Utah. I am delighted that the plans include the relocation of the stable. Accessory structures are an endangered species in the preservation effort. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, Todd Brashear, and then we'll have Gary Evershed. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to. Uh, talk in opposition to this project. Um, I, I have met with uh, uh, Jason and Justin, so the Masonic Temple representative and the developer. And, you know, I've listened to a lot of this. Um, my issue is um, kind of more to your requirements and for new construction in this historic district. And, you know, as I just go through each of the criteria, you know, these, this new construction is meant to, you know, kind of harmonize and complement the historic district that it's in. Uh, it, the buildings and the new construction should be similar in scale, size. Um, the access to light within, uh, you know, how it's affecting other properties, other historic structures, the property itself. Um, uh, upper floors that have, are massed and high, they're supposed to, you know, be stepped back. I notice here on what we all looked at, the developer took great pains to step back the south side and the east, uh, west side of this building. And as you can clearly see, massed everything on the north and the east corners. and to the point, you know, if we look at uh, the renderings that they have in the packet here, um, the height of uh, the McCarthy, the Walker McCarthy mansion, once again, not the Walker McCune mansion, the top gable is 40 feet high. This proposed development shows 60 feet. Um, so that's 20 feet higher than the top of the gable. Talk about in a straight wall masked up like that, the view is, is, is going to be not so great from South Temple, not to mention that access to light, what it's going to do to the parking terrace for the Walker McCarthy Mansion and the Simnani uh, property. I think you can see there is uh, a, a three-story parking structure, the top level of that. I think Semnani's and the Walker McCarthy is going to be a sheet of ice during the winter months because it will block out the, the sunlight. Um, and contrary to what they indicated, I think they said it's going to be 10 feet lower than the mansion. It's going to be 20 feet higher, 10 feet lower than the Masonic Temple. Um, I know. Two minutes is short to the extent you can okay. wrap up. Thank you. So the, the, real, the real issue is the massing of it on the north side and then, um, you know, why couldn't consideration for stepping back the building on the north side, you know, why did that get 
kind of short shift in this whole, this whole development. As I said, they took great pains for the south and the east side. And, you know, a couple other issues, the traffic flow, the cars that will be going out on to the 6th east side. I understand that was, the city feels, or Lex tells us, they don't, the city feels no traffic study needs to be done. I'm not so sure of that. With 125 cars at a minimum, most likely, if it's going to be 125 units, um, understand, you know, they still have to go through the lot line adjustments, the parcel consolidation, because you can't even build this building on that lot as it stands right now. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Uh, I mentioned Gary Evershed, but I just noticed that you checked that you did not wish to speak. Do you would? Would you please submit a card? If you could submit a card, that would be terrific. If you could, that would be terrific. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. I'm Max Smith. Um, I've architected a number of these restorations on South Temple, uh, Brigham Street, uh, not to mention the McCarthy Mansion, Walker McCarthy Mansion. It, it's the most important historic street in the state of Utah by any measure. The architects paid a lot of attention to three elevations, and then they gave us the north elevation, which is the backdrop for these historic buildings, especially McCarthy Mansion, off South Temple, off Brigham Street. I think we got cheated. I don't think it's right. And to sit here and talk about four inch depth of windows and one foot balconies, that wall, that north elevation, would be a disaster. And to stand out in front of the driveway of the Walker McCarthy Mansion at five feet above the ground and take a picture, which, what, proves that you can't see that building, is beyond absurd. You know, this is an important street, and it's very important, I think, that the backdrop to these historic buildings be paid attention to. I don't think we would sit here, or this council would sit here, this commission would sit here, and for one moment consider the same thing for the governor's mansion, the David Keith mansion, but it's the same. I will submit a card. Thank you. Uh, next up, Orlando Luna. After that, Monique Carlson. Mr. Luna? Uh, Monique Carlson. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, so it's uh, really interesting to be sitting, sitting in a historic building with a historic commission <laughs> talking about two historic groups. Um, and the preservation of which. So one is encroaching upon the other. It just seems so strange to me. Um, that said, because I am before the Historic Commission, <laughs> I um, would like to speak about the height of the north side of the building as well. Um, it is very much um, a space. The South Temple is a grand boulevard. It is one of the last, it is one of the few areas to come to. And I agree, the photo doesn't do justice to the situation that is actually going to transpire with the height of this building. That's my chief argument at the moment, is the height of this building. The straight sheer north wall um, massing, there will be basically a sore wound for a long time. Um, if, if forever. It, it totally ruins the view. Um, and I know views, you know, and I know we're in the situation where we're building and, and that's a big parking lot and it stands to be built. I get it. Um, and, you know, I think we need to be sensitive and take a moment and really um, acknowledge that north side and the height of it. Um, and again, thank goodness there's concession 
concessions being made on the west or yeah west side and the south side however when you go walk through that space you realize the impact is much greater than the pictures will show the um, angles tilted on the camera and the diagrams are helpful but it's also shocking um, and I finally want to say I work at the McCune Mansion. It is very important to me to help facilitate historic values moving forward. I have no issue with building and growing our state at all. Um, what I have issue with is the short-term gain for a, a situation that it's just, I think, ruining the relationship and the interface of that area. It's one of the last grand places that have not really been impacted on South Temple. And I think that's about it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Michael Fletcher. <clears throat> My name is Sean Fletcher, Michael Sean Fletcher. I am the general manager of the McHugh Mansion here in Salt Lake City. Um, I was going to also talk about the height of this building, but I think that's getting beat to death already. It's it's going to be sheer. It's going to be the worst thing you've ever seen. The McCune Mansion, I can say this from personal experience. The McCune Mansion has a building built right next to it. It's called the Panorama Apartments. It's a seven-story building, and it when you look out to the east of that uh, of the McCune Mansion and you see this building. It is, it is devastating. It should never have been built next to something as historic as the McCune Mansion. It's one of the finest buildings in Salt Lake City. We go back to the Walker Mansion, and it's, these, these owners that, that buy these buildings and do it, they're not, they, the money is, it, it doesn't grow on trees. These guys do this for, for the love of the building. They do this for our heritage, to pr preserve our history. And when you guys allow things like this to be built, that impede the people that, that have to work in these buildings, like myself, the McCarthy's, we spend more time in these buildings than we do in our own homes. If somebody came to you and told you, oh, guess what? Somebody's gonna build a, a five-story building right on your backyard property line. What would you guys think? Th th this is how these guys feel. This, this, they, sp they spend more time in these buildings than, than they do with their own homes. And we, we have a obligation to future <coughs> heritage, to future generations, to protect th these most precious buildings. These, this is one of the last ones on that street. There's not very many of them left. It's, it's your job to save these. That's all I can say. Thank you. Any questions? I invite any one of you to come up to the McCune Mansion and see, see the house. I would venture to say the McCarthy's would invite you to come up to the Walker Mansion and walk through and see for yourselves what what this building will do to to their building it's it's it, it will it will not be a good thing thank you uh, i have three cards uh from members of the audience who provided written comment but didn't indicate whether they whether they want to speak um i will read the written comments uh into the record unless uh, any of you want to come up? Uh, Rob Carlson, Michelle Turpin, Ken Rosma. Please, thank you. Once you sit down, t tell us your name and then. Uh, my name's Rob Carlson. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, history here in Utah, um, the historic building. I agree with a lot of what's been said here as far as preserving South Temple. Uh, we do need to grow. We need to have, you know, new buildings. There is infrastructure. I understand where the Masonic Temple is coming from, that they need a secure future for themselves. But when you really look at this plan, that north side is going to be a big eyesore. 
and uh, I think it could be shifted, it could be moved, it could be adjusted, and to sit down and work on that would be critical. That's, that's basically it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, unless, would you like to come up? Tell us your name and then. Michelle Turpin. Into the, into the mic. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit confused. I, I've heard that you guys are considering the, this project and the huge, enormous size of it because there's this desperate need for housing downtown. And I'm confused because I have a couple rental properties um, on Douglas Street right below the U. And I've tried to get approval to put a new garage with a little tiny casita. And I've been turned down and told that because it, it will not be within the guidelines of history and there's, because there wasn't one there before and it might obstruct the neighbors that I can't add more housing in an area where there's a huge desperate need because there's a growing university. So I guess, I guess my point is I don't, I don't understand. It seems hypocritical that you guys would protect my neighbors in a rental area and not protect these amazing historical homes that people have dumped probably way more money than what they're ever going to be worth into just for the sake of preserving history. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Ken Rosma. I'll just read. Uh, for sake of education and enlightenment purposes, let's say the opposition is 25 to 1 or 100 to 1 in opposition versus support. I ask you, the commission specifically, what does it take for the community to have a voice that carries the weight in power as the developer? What would it take? I've seen the plans. The massive structure looks like a sore thumb. I look forward to your response. You okay with me continuing to read? Is that appropriate? Okay. Uh, Sandra McCarthy says, uh, if there have to be Masonic apartments, they should be behind the Masonic temple since it's their big idea. Patrick Egbert, I'm concerned about traffic and the added traffic exiting the proposed project from 600 East across South Temple. 600 East is a one lane road with a traffic barrier. This will back up dramatically and cause issues between 6th East and South Temple. People will try to turn left across South Temple and that raises safety concerns. I think the project would be better to exit on 7th East because it is a right hand turn onto a much larger road designed and built for more traffic. Molly Spain, please do not let another high rise ruin the character of historic South Temple. And then just two more. Seth Spain, please do not uh, the historical buildings on South Temple with high-rise buildings. And Gary Evershed, I think a traffic study is needed. Lot consolidation, general appearance in keeping of historic nature of the area. Um, is there anyone else that would like to, to speak to this agenda item? Uh, sir, come on up. We'll have you do a card afterward, but uh, sit down and tell us your name. MC Rivetti, and I'd like to speak in favor of the project. Um, there's been the idea brought up over and over that South Temple is being destroyed. Um, no buildings are being taken down. No buildings are being affected as far as the structure goes. And as far as view goes, that's, that's, it's a faulty premise that it's damaging the historical nature of the buildings. All across the, the valley, buildings have been put up over the last 50 years that have obstructed the view of somebody who had a historic building at some point, right? If we continue to block buildings being put up that aren't damaging any historic building that's in, at present in, in that place, we're, we're going to halt the, the, the progress of our, our community. I mean, we all know that housing is an issue. It's been spoken of by a couple of people. And on top of that, like, we have to continue to allow progress to occur as long as it doesn't affect 
those buildings that are there that are historic nature. And we want to, all of us want to protect the historic nature of those buildings that are in the historic districts. And so this project doesn't affect those buildings as far as the structure goes themselves. They're not being damaged, they're not being harmed, and it's going to help bring a higher class of people to the area. They're going to help preserve it and bring in good people instead of something potentially going up in the future where houses in the area continue to fall apart and bring in other people who create vandalism and other things like that. This project helps preserve the historic district. It doesn't detract from it or destroy it. And so this, this belief that, that view is almighty compared to everything else is, is ridiculous. And so at some point we have to take into consideration the preservation of the historic district in other terms than view. The, the economic factor that this will bring in will also help preserve the historic district because of the people that will be there and will help revitalize the area and bring in perhaps other people to preserve other parts and make them higher area, bring in higher income people as well. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Could I address the gentleman's concern? Uh, no, we don't do a back and forth between the members of the audience. I have a gateway to address that. That's Could, how we, know. We, we don't, yeah, let's. So you read my card, but I just wanted to add something. Oh, please come on up and tell us your name. Uh, my name is Patrick Egbert. Um, I represent the Cumming family. They own the Keith Brown Mansion and the block directly west of the Governor's Mansion. Um, I, I want to voice my um, opposition and, and really focus on two areas. The first area is the traffic study. Um, I don't know if the, if the city um, considered the, the two large projects within a block of here that are under construction right now that will also add significant traffic to South Temple. Um, we sit on the corner between F Street and G Street in South Temple and there's multiple accidents that we witness from our building um, every year because of, because of traffic and re reiterating the point of exiting from 6th sixth, from sixth East instead of 7th. Um, 7th East is, is built for large traffic. Um, I also would also want to bring up the point of compromise from the developer and the, the Masonic Temple organization. They've done a lot of things to try to accommodate that. Um, the, only, um, the only reason they had to not put it behind their own building was that their people would have to walk through the parking lot a little bit longer. I think that in itself, if the building is right behind theirs, solves most of the issues that are discussed tonight and that should be highly considered from their standpoint. Thank you. Uh, we had one more card submitted, uh, Ray Hulse. Hi. I'd like to talk about the uh, opposition to the development of 1082 South Blair Street. I've lived on this block for at least 50 years. So I've seen more of what goes on in that block than anybody. I've lived there the longest. Um, and through the time that I've lived there, I see a lot of problems. And if I could talk to neighbors, if they were still here, some are still here, but uh, one of the problems is the alley it becomes kind of a, a nest, uh, a hangout uh, when people want to commit crime or, uh, you know, just uh, have a free-for-all. I've seen, uh, for example, uh, right across the alley from me, uh, somebody brought a couch out and was, it was out in the alley, and it was coming from the apartments. Now, the reason I can comment on this is because the one place that uh, people were accessing, uh, other than to just go to their, into their driveways, was uh, the apartments, which would be to the right. If you go straight across and you go to the right, there's the apartments. And uh, the apartment, uh, not yet, well, I don't know, we call them apartments, I guess, but they're, they're like three units there. 
and uh, my observation, I've, I've uh, had people told me, well, I, I used to live there and there was a big raid there. People were having a, a huge drug raid that went halfway around the blo block. It was from, uh, from uh, Harvard, you know, Herbert, t around that way, because he was talking about this specific corner. And into that, uh, apartment building but I guess the issue is this is the fact that in that in that area I have I have some personal reason in in, in doing that in in opposing it one is my house sits next to the alley so I'm actually more intimate which goes on in that alley and you'll hear yelling and fighting and all kinds of stuff going on there and that's not to say there aren't good people. People go into those units and uh, they, you know, uh, some of them are nice people, but you get anybody that's bad and it just becomes uh, a place where there's no way, you know, for people to, to see what's going on. Uh, it's a kind of a hiding place. If you wanted to create a, a place where drugs and anything else were going on, it would be in that area. And um, I could just ask you to come to closure. That'd be great. Thank you. Say again. It, we're over our two minutes. If you could just wrap up, that would be terrific. Oh, OK. Uh, the other thing is, like, uh, my neighbor says, well, you know, we've never had rats here before. And this as well as that those dumpsters the, uh, from the from the apartments. Well, you know, if you build another development that goes access from the back, you've got another situation, you know, for garbage and other stuff that's going on. Uh, I don't know how the, the garbage is going to be uh, maintained to that area. But it's just uh, if there's anything that would create a ghetto, it's it's putting uh, developments down an alley where there's a lot of crime and stuff goes on and it becomes a, a hiding place. And so that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Just want to confirm we've accommodated everyone. Terrific. Well, uh, d why don't we uh, allow the uh, developer to come on back up and we'll do five minutes of response. Sorry, bear with me a second. I didn't realize I took this out. I just want to. Uh, I certainly appreciate anyone who's willing to come out and speak and share their thoughts and is passionate about their property and what they do. I know that it takes it takes heart. It takes passion to do that. And I appreciate that. Um, as of about two o'clock, the last I saw. I know there's emails and, and massive letters in opposition. You have a packet that has an overwhelming uh, amount of written letters in support of this project. Contrary to what anyone might believe, I can tell you that great deference was taken as we looked at this building. It wasn't to give the pinky finger or any other finger to the property owners to the north. I think there are multiple things that allude to that. We, we could have brought the building back the six feet that just to accommodate the drive and then brought the building back to the setback. I think we could have gone with less articulation. I want to correct what was said. The window reveals are a four inch articulation at the window, but there are also two and a half and five foot fenestration articulation changes on that north facade. It's not a, a solid plane. Um, I was corrected by my uh, uh, legal counsel and, and being reminded part of the reason we did not get an access out to 7th East is because the zone is a different zone and a, a access through one zone cannot go to a different zone. That was something that I didn't know that we learned in our DRT with the city and they call it the shopping center effect. They don't want someone owning a shopping center buying a couple of homes creating an access into that shopping center through a residential zone or something else to a different zone. We learned that at, at the DRT. 
part of the reason in the rezone, the alley adjacent to the temple was rezoned. Um, now to now to the standards again, or, or the standards and some of the deference. Um, stepping the entirety of the west facade back, that 35 feet at a two-story level, is part of the deference that was paid to the Walker McCarthy Mansion. Did I call it the wrong name? Yes. I hope you also noticed other people who spoke on their behalf called it the wrong name. Did we write the, the Broadway at Eccles? We did. We looked at a Google map. It's not because I profess to be a massive historian. I apologize for that. Um, but great deference was paid to all adjacent properties in, in creating a developable site that was equal parts separated from historic structures. The, our response to the standard, which you have, and I don't know who in the audience may or may not have read all of it, it's 85 pages. We responded to every standard that's required for this. Light is not a standard. View is not a standard. The items that are standards for new construction inside of a historic district were responded to. And um, lastly, I want to talk about the, the, the parking lot. The reason that the eastern half of the parking lot wasn't looked at for development is it is a totally different underlying zone. It's institutional. The western half of this parking lot, if you go back to the zoning maps, more than half of it was already zoned RO. Changing every, all of the frontage along 600 East, with the exception of a drive aisle, was already zoned RO. The extension of the RO rezone squared that off uh, a lot consolidation application is in with the city consolidating the lots, making this a single parcel for development that fits these standards. But the RO zone already existed. It existed to the 60 feet of height already. We're conceding 40 feet of height in the front massive portion of this building, a great deal of which is seen from or seen over from the Walker McCarthy Mansion. We're not adding a story to further impact the Simnani office building. Great deference was taken as we looked at all four sides of this building, contrary to what anyone might believe. If there's any questions from the commission, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, we responded to the standards. We have a staff report that's 90-something pages long with a recommendation for a certificate of appropriateness for new construction. And we would respectfully request that you approve this matter. Thank you for your time. Okay, at this point we'll close the public portion of the hearing and uh, I would love to hear any discussion that members of the commission would like to offer. I'd like to clarify, we've heard a wide range of objections. What we are considering are the criteria listed for us here at the end, correct? That, well, uh, I'm sure Wayne and Paul can speak to that, but that's entirely correct. Things that lie outside of that, such as traffic studies, light, view, that's outside our purview. Sure. Sorry about that. Uh, what, uh, Victoria asked uh, whether our consideration was limited to the application of the design standards and guidelines uh, under the Historic Preservation Ordinance, and my answer was yes, that is correct. And there have been things that have been raised here tonight that are just well beyond our purview, and those include traffic, view, uh, access to light. Those are just not relevant aspects of the historic preservation standards. The standards in the ordinance are the only things you can consider. Stan, do you have... 
The only comment I have listening to all this, and as some of these people know, and maybe some in the audience, I'm a Abbott Avenue South Temple person from way, way back. And I feel bad because everybody doesn't think a north face of this building looks good, and I may be one of them. But we had, somebody asked a question that was read about how many people have to speak out against something like this to have the public carry the day. And I don't know the answer to that, but I think the answer might resemble uh, thousands may speak out against it, but they can't change the legal basis and things of that that we are constrained by to have to give these gentlemen who have their money and their plans and their future and invested in this thing and have responsibilities to their people. We have to allow them to do what they have the right to do as a landowner. And unfortunately, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but it isn't, as we've learned, it isn't a standard that they necessarily, nor thousands of us who have disagree with them, uh, have control over. They, they have the right in, in a lot of times if they conform to the specifications and the standards and the city approves it, then I think we're somewhat tied no matter how many people don't like it. Jessica or Esther, Russia. Mr. Chair, can I? Can I just make a point of clarification just yeah, for the record? Uh, one comment was made that a uh, access to light was not necessarily something to consider. I do want to just point out that there is a design objective. It's not um, the, the way that these work is that there's uh, the, the zoning ordinance standards for review, um, which is what you are charged with reviewing and making a determination of um, whether or not it meets those standards. Uh, we also have what are called design objectives. Those are things that kind of help in deciding these things, but they're all kind of made with a should um, because in some aspects it, it may or may not work. Uh, but I do want to just point out, just because uh, some statements were made that that's it, the access to light isn't something that's considered, um, that we there is a design objective that says new multifamily building should be should be designed to respect access to light and the privacy of adjacent buildings. I just want to make sure that that's on the record um, and considered. Thank you for the correction. Wayne, and for the purpose of my own understanding, those standards are listed in the far left column here. That's correct. The objectives are listed in the middle. That's and unless evidence that contradicts what the staff has presented to us and what the developers have, which is in this rightmost column, it would be outside of the Historic Landmark Commission purview to not grant the certificate of appropriateness, correct? Well, the, the staff's role in this is to, is to review the project and provide our recommendation. Um, you're not required to follow that. Um, but it's a guidance. It, it's something, here's the information, we've reviewed this, but it is the HLC's responsibility to make the findings on those standards. Does that help? Um, well, I had one just procedural question, which is uh, we've had either one or two uh, work sessions on this project, right? Um, do the, are those noticed out the same way that, to the neighbors in the same way that public meetings are? They are. Um, well, to me, it, it's unfortunate that we've landed where we have. Um, there have been um, some opportunities to really engage long before we got to this, it seems like, which pro it seems like have been missed. So that's unfortunate. Anything else? I'll say something. So I would just like to echo what Stan, you know, discussed, and you couldn't have said that any better. But at the same time, I'm also wondering if um, developers, you're going to have to have a relationship with the adjacent properties. 
moving forward, you have to have a plan in place because this there's a lot of tension and it's not going to go away. So that's something that you will have to work somehow to address because this relationship is going to be a long-term relationship. And um, I'd hate to see the, the neighbors upset for, you know, a long time. And this has nothing to do with my um, view on the project. It is a great project. And um, it's a good thing that's being placed in that section. So, but at the same time, there's that other part that you will have to work on. Uh, well, what does anyone, uh, would anyone like to make a motion? If there's no further comment. So I will go ahead and motion. Please. Okay. Based on an analysis and findings in the staff report that the standards are for approval of a certificate of appropriateness involving new construction in a local historic district have been substantially met. Testimony and propose, proposal presented. I move that the, that the commission approve the request for new construction located at approximately 33 South, 600 East. Is there a second? Button. I'll second that. Jessica, would you lead us off? Um, yes. Yes. Petro Eschler, aye. Stoll, aye. Torres Mora, aye. The motion passes unanimously. Do I have a uh, appeal language you want me to read? Or perhaps you would do, uh, yeah, do uh, if anybody interest, uh, who uh, is aggrieved by the, a decision of the Historic Landmark Commission uh, may appeal that decision to the city's appeals hearing officer um, within 30 days of the issuance of a decision in this matter. Do we have a motion to recess? I'll make it. All in favor? Hi. Okay, uh, we're in recess. Let me Thank let me you. let me correct that. It's it's thirty. It's thirty if the applicant. It's ten days uh, to appeal if uh, if it's anybody other than the applicant. So sorry, um, the information's on the agenda for appealing. Thank you. Uh, we are recessed. <laughs>